Hello. The reports of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, or IPCC, provide key scientific evidence to the international climate negotiations. Today, in this presentation, I want to look together at what the future projections and pathways that are used in the Working Group 1 report of the sixth assessment report of the IPCC tell us about the Paris Agreement long-term temperature goal. Starting with the Paris Agreement long-term temperature goal, which is to hold the increase in global average temperature to well below 2 degrees and to pursue efforts to limit it to 1.5. This global temperature goal has been further strengthened or has received an even stronger focus on 1.5 during COP26 uh, in 2021 in Glasgow, where the decision was to resolve to pursue efforts to limit the temperature increase to 1.5. So this provides us with very clear global context as to what the international climate negotiations are aiming to achieve. What information does the IPCC provides us to inform what is necessary to achieve these goals? First and foremost, here I draw on one of the figures of the summary for policymakers of the IPCC latest working group one contribution to the sixth assessment report, and which shows the near linear relationship between cumulative emissions here on the horizontal axis and global mean temperature increase on the vertical axis. And what this really shows is that every ton of CO2 emissions uh, that we emit into the atmosphere adds to global warming. And the figure shows that this is true both for the historical period uh, on the left-hand side of the graph, as well as for projections uh, under a variety of scenarios, to which I will come back later. Here you can see that depending on the cumulative emissions that we emit until 2050, we would end up around 1.5 or around two and a half degrees of warming. So from a physical science perspective, limiting human induced global warming to a specific level requires limiting cumulative CO2 emissions, which means that we need to reach at least net zero CO2 emissions, along with strong reductions in other greenhouse gases. From this near linear relationship that we see here on the left, we can then also draw more quantitative uh, implications. And this is what was carried out in this table that is also from the summary for policymakers of the IPCC report. And it really shows that we know what needs to be done to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. Starting at the top of this table, we see that um, current warming of around 1.1 degrees has been caused to a large degree by the historical emissions from 1850 to date of which there were roughly 2,400 billion tons. At the same time, the lower end of the table then tells us what needs to happen uh, in the future, and if we still want to limit warming to 1.5 or other temperature limits. So let's focus on 1.5. Given where we are today, that gives us for a 50% probability of limiting warming to 1.5, a remaining carbon budget of about 500 billion tons of carbon dioxide, starting to count from the beginning of 2020. For context, currently we are emitting around 40 billion tons of carbon dioxide annually into the atmosphere. If we think that a one in two chance of limiting warming to 1.5 degrees is insufficient, then we would go to higher likelihoods and thus lower carbon budgets. Um, in the same way, if lower probabilities are acceptable or lower likelihoods, we would look at the left-hand side and have slightly larger budget. Importantly, any of those numbers can also be higher or lower by around 220 billion tons of CO2, which is a sizable chunk for carbon budgets compatible with 1.5 degrees, depending on how successful we are or how unsuccessful we are in reducing non-CO2 emissions, including methane, nitrous oxide, and fluorinated gases. The IPCC report doesn't only calculate carbon budget, but also uses emission scenarios. And it uses these emission scenarios as tools 
to understand our global future. And these figures here show the core set of five illustrative scenarios that have been used throughout the IPCC Working Group 1 report to illustrate how future climate change depends on our choices and our emissions over the coming decades and the rest of the century. Here on the left hand side in the large panel you can see the evolution of uh, global carbon dioxide emissions. Uh, the scenarios are labeled with their, with their scientific labels. In more accessible terms, these scenarios are referred to as the very high, high, intermediate, low, and very low scenario, respectively. You can also see here on the right-hand side, and this is just selection, that these scenarios do not include only uh, carbon dioxide emissions, but also assume uh, accompanying evolutions of non-CO2 uh, greenhouse gases and aerosols. For example, here at the top, you can see the methane uh, evolutions that go with the scenarios on the left and also uh, nitrous oxide and sulfur dioxide. What do these scenarios imply for global warming? This figure shows the global warming uh, projections or both historical and then projections of those five scenarios. And what you can see is that over the first decades, these scenarios don't distinguish so strongly in terms of absolute temperatures, although the rate of warming differs quite significantly. And by the end of the century, there is a spread of almost three degrees between the lowest and the highest scenario. Looking a bit more in detail to the numbers and, and the quantifications of the temperature outcome of these different scenarios, uh, we can look at table SPM1 of the summary for policymakers where, these, where this information is highlighted. First and foremost, I think it is really important to see that in the near term, all scenarios, um, the best estimate is that they will reach 1.5 degrees. At the same time, there is a very important difference between what happens afterwards. In the lowest scenario, 1.5 degrees is reached but warming doesn't continue to increase significantly thereafter. By mid-century, there is still an important probability that warming might still be below 1.5, while the best estimate is 1.6. And by the end of the century, because of the assumed carbon dioxide removal, net global carbon dioxide removal in those scenarios, warming has been reversed slightly with now a best estimate of 1.4. In all other scenarios, you can see a continued increase in warming until the end of the century, with um, the intermediate high and very high scenario already having a best estimate of two degrees of warming by mid-century and well beyond two degrees by the end of the century. So what do these illustrative pathways of the IPCC report tell us for the need for uh, carbon dioxide removal? In essence, not very much yet. These illustrative pathways span a range of very high to very low emissions, but they do not show the variations in CO2 removal strategies uh, that could be applied to achieve the lowest pathway and that have been identified in the literature. And here on the left-hand side, you can see the same figure of the, of the working group 1 SPM, and on the right hand side, I have now added a snapshot of the special report on global warming of 1.5 degrees. And to first order, on the right, what the right hand side, particularly the pathways shown by P1, P2 and P3, show alternatives for how this very low scenario of working group one could be achieved. And on the right hand side, it shows fossil fuel and industry emissions and their reductions in gray, the contributions of agricultural, forestry, and land use uh, emissions in brown, and then the contributions of bioenergy with carbon capture and storage, or BECs, in yellow. And what you can see if you look at the pathways P1, P2, P3, is that the relative contribution of these different measures uh, varies significantly in these different pathways. And that means that there are key strategic choices to be made about how much carbon dioxide removal and which type of carbon dioxide removal is used to 
follow a pathway that is consistent with limiting maximum warming close to 1.5 degrees C and in line with the long-term global goal of the Paris Agreement and the strengthened emphasis on 1.5 of the Glasgow Climate Pact.